UFC 283 Teixeira vs. Hill takes place this weekend and I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main events, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card, starting with the early prelim opener of Daniel Marcos vs. Simon Oliveira. I'm going to side with Daniel Marcos as the underdog here because this is kind of like a 50-50 matchup and they have made Simon Oliveira quite a decent favorite. So I'm leaning towards Daniel Marcos because I've seen in Simon Oliveira's game nothing that he's really done that's massively impressed me. You know, he sort of like barely got by against a good guy in Jose Alde, no, no, no doubt. Like he's a good fighter, but he barely scraped by on the contender series and he won that fight based on getting some takedowns in some good moments and stuff like that. So I was thinking, okay, he's got a bit of grappling to his game. And then he goes in there against Tony Gravely, who although is not one of the worst bantamweights in the world, like we've seen some talented bantamweights get wins over him, including like Nate Maness who got a win over him, who doesn't even seem that great in the bantamweight division himself. And Javid Basharat looked good against him and won that fight pretty convincingly. So um, Gravely's not terrible, but he's not the best in the bantamweight unranked area. And he was able to really easily neutralize the game of Simon Oliveira and just ragdoll him around the cage pretty much for the entire fight. Like he got a bunch of takedowns on Simon Oliveira and Daniel Marcos undefeated, bigger guy for the division as well. I mean, Tony Gravely got 11 takedowns on Simon Oliveira and Daniel um, Marcos showed really, really good takedown defense on the contender series. He got taken down a few times, but he worked his way back up against Brandon Lewis, who was a pretty decent prospect as well. And um, he also stuffed like, I want to say 11 of 13 takedowns in that fight. So if this stays standing, I think it's a bit 50-50. But I'm actually going to give a little bit of a, a grappling advantage to Daniel Marcos, in all honesty here. Just in the hustle that he has in those positions and his stubbornness in those positions as well. Plus, he's undefeated. He's been way more active as well. He th he fought in um, September of 2022. Before that, he was a little bit inactive. I get it. He didn't fight in 2021 or 2020, but he came back, looked really good on the Contender Series, um, and he's been active at least recently in the past few months, whereas we've got a guy here in Simon Oliveira who hasn't fought in an entire year. I want to say his last fight was January 2022, so I'm siding with the underdog here, starting off the card. I think it's 50-50, leaning towards Marcos anyway. I'm going to side with him. We move on. Up the card, Luan Lacerda versus Cody Stamen. I'm going with Cody Stamen. This is a dangerous one to pick because... You know, we never really know when a guy like Cody Stamen's really going to start showing that decline that most sort of veteran names show in the bantamweight division. Like, when does Cody Stamen become the next Eddie Wineland of the bantamweight division? But I think the fact that he showed against Eddie Wineland that he was still levels above him, I don't mind the loss to Saeed Namagomedov. You know what I mean? I don't mind the loss to Marab Devalashvili. Jimmy Rivera. These are really, really good bantamweight names. And other than that, he's only lost to Aljamain Sterling. He's beaten guys like Alejandro Perez. Kelleher, he beat him. Um, he got a draw with Song Yudong. And Song Yudong, we see how talented he is in the bantamweight division. So I, th I still think there's a level of opponent where Stamen can still get the job done against. And it's not like he's made a bunch of money in his career either. You know, he's training at Extreme Couture. Still hungry, still wanting to make a bit of money for himself. Only 33 years of age, it's not like he's 35, 36. So I'm going to side with him against Luan Lacerda. Lacerda's dangerous, but are you going to outgrapple Cody Stamen, a really, really solid grappler for that division, and get the submission over him? Are you Saeed Namakamedov's level? I don't think you are. And say you don't only got the, t uh, the submission because he hurt. Stamen on the feet and Stamen shot a bad takedown out of panic so it's not like say he took him down and dominated him there so I'm gonna side with Cody Stamen being able to survive some bad situations here and uh, really give some problems to Lacerda as the fight goes on so I'm gonna go with Stamen surviving a bad situation in the first round winning 29-28 based on the last two with his wrestling pressure and stand up we move on up the card, Josie Ann Nunes versus Zara Farron. I'm going to go with Josie Ann Nunes. She's way more masculine. Um, it, look at her. You know what I mean? I'm going to go with Josie Ann Nunes. Zara Farron dos Santos, which I believe was in her name, at least recently, but that's obviously been removed. But um, she's good. She's lost to like some really good female fighters. Other than that, she didn't look bad as a prospect, but they just gave her to Megan Anderson and Felicia Spencer. But... If you're getting KO'd by Felicia Spencer in the first round to TKO ground and pound, and Megan Anderson's pulling off a triangle choke against you in the first round as well and just doing what she wants with you, and 
it, it's just it's tough to trust her to win this one. She's a big girl for the division, but Josie Ann Nunes, she throws punches like a man. She just throws punches like a man. And sometimes there's just women that do that. And Ramona Pascal was very, very tough in her fight against uh, Josie Ann Nunes. And Josie Ann Nunes just kept the pace up, so it showed that she can do it for three rounds and escape some bad positions in the grappling as well. I really see her starching Zerafan by KO, who hasn't been in a cage since February of 2022. February of 2022, you haven't been in a cage, you're coming off a TKO loss anyway, and you're going in there against maybe the most dangerous puncher outside of Nunes in bantamweight and featherweight women's divisions right now. Josie Ann Nunes has so much power in her hands. I reckon she gets this one done. She's had time to improve. I'm going to go over finding the KO here on Zara Farron. And she's so short for the division, so naturally women do keep their chin up a little bit. But when there's someone so much shorter than them, like Andrade actually does expose this quite a bit in women's divisions as well. They can find the chin a little bit easier. Because, you know, it's naturally harder to tuck that chin against a shorter opponent as a taller fighter. They haven't really figured that out in women's MMA yet. So, um, I'm going to go Josie Ann Nunes by KO in the first round. We move on. Up the card. Wale Alves versus Nicholas Dalby. Man. I, I'm going to go Dalby. But it's worrying. This is one of them fights. This is truly like a... A really close fight that I've kind of been going either way with. I wish they would have given some kind of underdog to maybe sway my opinion here, but it's evens. I'm going to side with Nicholas Dalby in that case. If there's no money to make on either of them as an underdog, I'm going to side with Dalby. You know, he just seems to... I, if it doesn't end by first round KO, is what I'm thinking here. You know what I mean? If there isn't a first round KO, which if there is, it's going to be on the side of Wale Alves, in my opinion. If there isn't a first round KO... It's going to be a Nicholas Dalby win, I'm pretty sure. You know what I mean? Like, we just saw Wale Alves get KO'd pretty badly by Jeremiah Wells. And I think Nicholas Dalby is aware of his problem in the first round enough. And he knows that the danger is going to be in that first round. So I feel like he's going to be more prepared to sort of just sort of like scoot around in that first round. Escape some dangerous positions. And then start to work as the fight goes on on Wale Alves. I'm going to trust in him to make Wale Alves gas out and get the win as the fight goes on, in my opinion. We see that a lot with Wale Alves. He starts doing pretty good. But if I, I feel like, am I wrong in saying Nicholas Dalby has a very similar style with James Krause? Almost. Very pitter-patter shots. Doesn't really put a lot of power into what he does. Floats around a little bit. Very floaty on the feet. Circles a bunch and stuff like that. Little kicks at range and stuff. I think if James Krause can figure you out at any point, Dalby can as well. Um, and plus, Wale Alves is coming off a KO loss. Hasn't been in there for the entirety of 2022. Um, I'm going to side with Nicholas Dalby getting this one done. We move on. Up the card. Terence McKinney versus Ishmael Bonfirm. I'm going to go with Terence McKinney. But again, man, this is dangerous. I see 80% of people picking Terence McKinney. But I'm like, dude, Bonfirm has been a guy that people have been really paying attention to in his career, like, like, you know, he lost to Hanato Moicano on the regional scene in, like, 2014, I'm pretty sure, and it's like, okay, you know what I mean, oh, well, you know, Hanato Moicano at that point went on to become, like, a top featherweight contender, top five featherweight contender, only losing to, like, Ortega and Jose Aldo, so it's like, you know, it's such a dangerous fight for McKinney, but I do trust in McKinney's weird, weird, wiry speed, and power in that early round like the way he nearly put away doba so quickly like that the dude starts fights at a different frequency to other fighters and i think he will be able to find that finish on bum firm plus a lot of people don't even talk about this when it comes to terence mckinney he has that wrestling background and as much as bum firm has been fighting very good opponents i haven't been seeing that finishing ability recently and you could argue listen this is the weirdest part about the ufc i was thinking about this Terence McKinney's fought worse competition than Bonfirm. Outside of Dober, of course. The Dober fight's a bit different. Um, but he's been getting, like, Foresi Am, Eric Gonzalez, and stuff like that. And he beat Matt Frivola. Like, Bonfirm's, like, 10-1, and 12-2 and 2 at LFA. He fought 28-3 and 3, Abasov on the Contender Series, who was very good as well. Like, this guy's a problem. But I got aside with that first round finishing ability of Terence McKinney. But I will say, if this goes past the first round and Bonfirm hasn't been hurt, and let's say McKinney's been trying to hurt him, 
switch your money up and go on bomb firm as the fight goes on is all i'll say but i will bet on the first round finish of terence mckinney i reckon he'll catch bomb firm with some punches lack up uh, latch up the rear naked choke afterwards is what i'm gonna go with after hurting bomb firm on the feet yeah risky one though very risky for mckinney if he wins this is a massive statement just it's this ain't no regular guy making a debut we move on up the card jelton almeida versus shamil abdurakimov i'm gonna be going with jelton almeida here pretty self-explanatory he is ragdolling absolutely everyone he is a um, escaped lab experiment from brazil he's on all the source possible there's no way in hell this guy is natural he has started his face i'm not even joking here his face has started to morph into Nganu's face. I'm not the only one seeing that, right? His face has began to morph into a more Nganu looking face. Just by proxy of taking a bunch of roids. They're like, the roids in his system are like, oh, this guy's taking roids? Oh, we better make him look like Nganu then. And, they, and I don't mean the body. You know what I mean? But this guy is definitely on sun. Is all I'm going to say. And uh, his team, he trains, his main training partner, Carlos Felipe tested positive for roids so that's a big factor as to why i'm picking him but um shamil abdurakimov just don't fucking fight he don't fight this guy don't fight and it's worrying to see that when the guy's 41 years of age although he does have a good grappling background and of course his surname would suggest that he has a good grappling background as well losing to chris dorcas looks terrible in hindsight does it not losing to chris dorcas Looks awful. And even though Dorcas beat him, I was still saying Dorcas is about to get exposed after this. You know, because Shamil was tagging him with some decent shots. But it just seems like Shamil isn't the athlete that some of these new heavyweight guys are. And, you know, Pavlovich KO'd him in 2022. And now he's back in 2023. He just doesn't stay too active. He's had a bunch of fights cancelled against Jelton Almeida recently. And uh, now he's taking him on finally. Uh, seeing as they couldn't get him another matchup, it seems. Um, but yeah, I just don't believe in Shamil Abdurakimov odds are he's 41 coming into this fight with a knee injury and he's going to try and stuff takedowns against Jelton Almeida who although I get it hasn't fought the best of competition it's the way he's beaten these guys and also his win on the contender series as well was weirdly good am I thinking of the the right guy here who am I thinking of yes Nasruddin Nasruddinov just out grappled the Dagestani on the contender series then beat Danilo Marquez, who's a hell of a grappler in the light heavyweight division as well. He's outdoing people at their own game, competing in grappling tournaments in the meantime. I reckon he's going to win this one via rear naked choke in the first round again. I think this is going to be a walkover for Jelton Almeida. He's on the source. We move on to another fight on the card, which is Gabriel Bumfam versus Munir Lazez. I'm going with Gabriel Bumfam. I'm going with Gabriel Bonfam. Who are people picking in this one? Let me find out. Yeah. Vast majority in favor of Munil is, uh, in favor of Gabriel Bonfam. Um he's good. I reckon he'll get the submission. Taken down Munil Azez. Who's a striker, but you know, he beats some of the bottom of the barrel strikers in a division. Um he looks good when he strikes. Very good, but I just the options are in favor of Bonfam here. He has many ways to go out there and win this fight. And I think he'll be able to go out there and get this one done. He's a 2-1 to one favorite. I get that. Maybe a little bit more of a favorite would be good, seeing as Umar's getting like 7-1 to one over Hany Barcelos. But I think I think Gabriel Bonfirm's going to show up big for the Bonfirm family. Maybe the other one's going to lose to McKinnon. But um, I think he'll show up big time here against Lezez. I think he'll get his takedown and find the submission. He has a bunch of wins by submissions. And it's not even like... You know, he's wearing people down and then getting the sub. Like, he's just putting them in positions to sub them. You know what I mean? He gets a dash choke in the first round, minute 19 seconds in um, at LFA. And then he goes on the contender series, takes down Trey Waters, who was an undefeated guy at the time, and uh, just subs him with a Von Flew. It's just, it's, it's interesting to see. So I'm definitely going to go with Bon Firm here. Being able to get this fight to the ground and find his submission in some way. I reckon Rene could choke. Or TKO to ground and pound. We'll see how good Muna Lezez is at defending those positions. We move on. Up the cards. Yago Moises. Versus the new guy. Um, Miliquilazel Costa. Oh god look at him. Um, yeah I'm going to go with. Um, Tiago Moises here. Is what I'm going to go with. I think he'll find the submission. 
I think Moises is a very underrated lightweight. And I think I really underrated Makashev on his rise because of how he looked against Moises. But now Makashev's gone on and become champ. It's all, all of a sudden it flips the switch of everything you believed. And now I'm like, oh my god, Moises is actually pretty good, dude. He took down Makashev. He survived till the fourth round. Like, he did okay in hindsight compared to a lot of the other contenders. So, I think Moises is underrated. And I think against people his size, he's going to be doing well against him, especially in the grappling well, uh, realm. You know, he's lost to Joel Alvarez. Got beaten up there, but Joel Alvarez is huge. And Moises, he doesn't really have too much of an ability to get things to the ground. He showed an improvement in that against Christos Giagos by going out there and immediately forcing him into a position and having like a Pantoja Perez type performance with the standing rear naked choke. I just don't trust the submission defense of Costa going in on short notice. I'm going with Moises having another Pantoja Perez type performance, pushing him back, landing big shots. Finding the back and rear naked choking him in the first round. We move on. Gregory Rodriguez versus Bruno Ferreira. Again, I'm not trusting Bruno Ferreira stepping in on short notice. There was a lot more interesting matchups. Like, this was supposed to be the Tavares fight, right? Um, you're coming in on short notice and you're trying to throw down with Gregory Robocop Rodriguez. Come on, brother. It ain't gonna work. Obama is gonna get you. He's on the source. He is looking 20 years older than he actually is. Um, siding with him here. He's looked good in his last few fights. Armand Petrosian fight. Very close fight. I gave it to Armand Petrosian, but it was very close. You can give it to Gregory Rodriguez. And Petrosian's no joke either, especially on the feet. And he has good takedown defense himself. Um, I think Bruno Ferreira, the Hulk, swinging like crazy in the first round, which is what he's done so far in his career. You're going to play that game? with with Gregory Rodriguez you're going to you're going to step in on short notice and swing for defenses with Gregory Rodriguez we'll see how it goes dude i mean he might get it done and we all of a sudden we're talking about him as a new prospect coming up in the division but i reckon Gregory Rodriguez is going to put him on his ass pretty quickly in this fight and and take him out he's also going to be quite a bit bigger than Bruno Ferreira as well so yeah, I reckon he finds the KO in the first round. In a back-and-forth scrap, I'll give Fahea that. He'll land some shots. We move on to another fight. Shogun Hua versus Igor Pateria. I never really believed in Igor Pateria. I picked against him in the Nagumariyanu fight as well because he has he has hype. Because he looks a bit like McGregor with the shades on. And he's got a cool nickname, the Duelist, and all this type of stuff. And his fight style is really fun. But he's such a can crusher. Such a dirty can crusher. And when he won that fight against Sadolsky, I was very shocked. So it's like he's been can crushing, but he proved he can get a win over some decent opponents as well. But it, it's worrying here. He will beat Shogun Hua. But man, I can see some random moment where Shogun gets to win. I'm going with Igor Pateria though. I'm going with Igor Pateria. I think you'll find a TKO on Shogun. Shogun looks awful in his last few fights. I know he got a split against Ovin St. Pru, but I think St. Pru clearly won that fight, just keeping him at range, toying with him at range while Shogun was really struggling to land shots. And Shogun's 41, dude. 41 years of age. Eagle Pateria is going to get scrappy with Shogun early on, and it's going to be about who lands the punch first. I'm going to trust the young guy... Not even in his prime yet. 26 years of age. He was doing good against Nagumanianu. Taking some big shots. Landing some good flurries back as well. Won the fight against an undefeated good prospect in Sadolsky on the Contender Series. I'm going to trust him to win this one as well. I just... It's tough to uh, trust in Shogun who are here. You know, the odds of him carrying an injury into this fight. What they've done is they've said, Okay, Shogun, one last fight in your career. We're putting you on the Brazil card in front of your home fans. But the cost is you need to build some hype for Pateria to get a good win in a good position on the card. So I'm going to go with Pateria, but it would be good to see Shogun win. I don't think he will. First round TKO for Ihor Pateria. We move on. Paul Craig versus Johnny Walker. I'm going with Johnny Walker here. I'm going with Johnny Walker. I think Paul Craig is going to get KO'd in this fight. And I can see it happening to ground and pound. Johnny Walker, I've told you this. His grappling is so underrated. Maybe it's purely because of his athleticism, but his grappling is so underrated, dude. The way he looked against Nikita Krylov, who, listen, I know Paul Craig found the triangle on him, 
But Krylov was dominating that fight. Really dominating that fight. In the grappling. And, and Walker wasn't staying on the ground with Krylov. He was reversing position. And that was two years ago now. And he's made rapid improvements in his grappling game as well. He tried to play the patient game against Santos. Um, he found the finish against Ryan Spann. Um, which is a very good win in hindsight, right? Um, got KO'd by Jamal Hill. I don't think he's going to have to worry about the stand-up of Paul Craig. And that's something that's a massive advantage for him here. I think he's going to be... When he fought Kutalaba, I think he was worried about KO power. About getting chinned. Same with Jamal Hill. Same with Thiago Santos. Same with Ryan Spann. Knowing his chin, he was ultimately worried in those matchups going in. As much as he might have wanted to convince himself otherwise. I think we're going to see a truly confident Paul Craig. I think we're going to see a truly confident Johnny Walker. There's no threat on the feet with Paul Craig. He doesn't know how to strike. You know? So I think we're going to see Walker very confident on the feet. Paul Craig shooting for things that he might not be able to get. Ending up on a single leg against a cage. And Johnny Walker sort of just elbowing him in the head and punching him. And Paul Craig's chin has never really been the best. So I'm going to side with Johnny Walker finding this one. Punches to like a... Paul Craig shooting for a takedown. Hammer fists in those positions as well after rocking Paul Craig on the feet early on. He forces a bad takedown out of Paul Craig and uh, finishes him off with shots to the side of the head like he did to Ryan Spann. Johnny Walker gets this one done. We move on. Up the card. Jessica Andrade versus Lauren Murphy. Andrade is one of the only women's flyweight fighters that can fight. Uh, she'll win this one. Um, I'm going with Andrade. Uh, Lauren Murphy... Just looks like she's fighting blind. Uh, Misha Tate is also terrible in hindsight. Even I picked her to win that fight. I just don't think Laura Murphy is good at fighting. And I think Andrade throws, throws punches like a man. She throws punches like someone who knows what they're doing. And that's a massive difference in women's MMA. Because not a lot of women do that. And uh, that's just the end of it. I know Lauren Murphy on paper did better against Valentina Shevchenko than Jessica Andrade did. But, I mean... She's finishing Caitlin Chukagan in the first round. She finishes Cynthia Calvillo in the first round. She finishes Amanda Lemos in the first round. This is stuff that, like, Lauren Murphy would take to a split decision. You know what I mean? And win it barely on the cards, 29-28. So, I just think there's a difference in the way that both of them perform. And I'm going to side with Jessica Andrade getting the KO win over Lauren Murphy. I don't see Murphy winning this one at all. So, I'll go Andrade body shots. We move on. Gilbert Burns versus Neil Magny. I'm going Gilbert Burns. But I don't know. I just want to say this in hindsight, yeah. If I'm wrong on any fight on this card, I think it's the Gilbert Burns one. I'm picking Gilbert Burns, but this is my least confident pick, funnily enough. He should win. He should win. He's Gilbert Burns. Look how he did against Hamzat Chimeyev. He should win. But Neil Magny throws straight punches at range with a massive reach advantage over Gilbert Burns. And Gilbert Burns struggles with straight punches at range against people with reach advantages. We've seen in the build-up, Gilbert Burns has been working some takedowns offensively. Um, I think he will find the takedowns on Neil Magny because Magny seems to make such massive mistakes when he's trying to defend uh, takedowns off of these opponents. Um, and I think we're going to see a more offensive grappling game out of Gilbert Burns here. And I think he will find the rear naked choke on Neil Magny, or a TKO to ground and pound, or an arm triangle or something like that. It would really surprise me if Magny won, but I can just see it coming in some weird way that MMA works. I can just see it. Somehow. I just notice it. You know, but Magny is taking a pretty quick turnaround after taking some damage. I like that Burns has taken a bit of time off since the Chimea fight to really like... I think even though he lost the Chimea fight, he sort of showed himself, I've still got it. And I can still make a run towards the belt, you know? Because Chimea is probably going to be favorited against Usman, Edwards, and Covington. And Burns almost beat Chimea. So I think he's going to give himself a boost of confidence there. Neil Magny took quite a bit of damage in the D-Rod fight, so I can see him getting clipped by a big punch as well in close and ended up getting knocked down and then finished on the ground maybe. But um, I'm going to side with Gilbert Burns. D-Rod ended up on top of Magny in a few occasions and let him back up like a moron. Um, Burns won't let him back up. He'll find the finish from there. So I'm siding with Gilbert Burns, getting this one done by submission, 
But I do worry about the style matchup, I'll be honest. We move on to another fight on the card, which is Davison Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno for the quadrilogy. It's here. I'm going with Brandon Moreno in the quadrilogy. I'm siding with him again. I picked Figueredo in the first one, in the second one. Then I switched to Moreno. Figueredo won the third fight. And then Moreno, I think, is going to win the quadrilogy as well. Um, it's worrying because it's one of those fights where it's just like whoever shows up on the night is really going to get it done. And I know Moreno's had a little bit of trouble with his team and his fight camp and stuff like that. Um, but I've got to take this. They're evens. I've got to take Moreno. Because I just noticed when I'm watching the fights, Moreno won, I want to say, like 20 minutes of their 25 minute, not 20 minutes. Moreno won like 17 minutes of their 25 minutes of fighting in that trilogy. But Figueredo knocked him off balance in the first, knocked him off balance with a leg kick in the first round, knocked him down at the very end of the third round and threatened a dash choke that won him that round. Knocked him down in the fifth round that won him that round as well. Figueredo's chances of winning seem a lot heavier reliant on chance. You know what I mean? Whereas Moreno seems like he is the better striker out of the two of them. He's got the better gas tank. He seems to win the scrambles when they when they go for takedowns. Um, and Figueredo seems to just have those moments where he gets it done. You know? And I think Figueredo... I don't know. I think he's got some problems in his stand-up in terms of his defense. At times, he leaves his head wide open. Um, Moreno's got a hell of a chin. Figueredo's 35 years of age in the flyweight division is all I'm going to say. The weight cut's not going to get easier for him. Brandon Moreno, 29 years of age. He's only getting better and better as his career goes on. Um, he can always go back to his old team. Like For Moreno, when he's such a high-profile fighter, he can move and people will accommodate him. You know, Big gyms will accommodate Brandon Moreno with his move. And I'm assuming he probably moved with some of the flyweights um, from Glory MMA anyway, because they probably all went to the same area to train. Um, he looked good against Kai Kara France. He's been way more active. We haven't seen Figueredo in an entire year. You know? Haven't seen him in an entire year. Getting older. 35. The weight cut's never good. He was injured with a bad uh, hand. He broke his hand. In the Moreno fight. I'm trusting Moreno to win this one. As long as he sort of deals with those leg kicks early. I think he can easier adjust to Figueredo's successes. Than Figueredo can adjust to Moreno's. You know? So I'm going to side with. Brandon Moreno in the quadrilogy. Via decision. 49-46. Pretty clear. We move on. Up the card. Glover Teixeira versus Jamal Hill. I'm going to go with Glover Teixeira here. He has been made an underdog in this matchup. So I have to pick Glover Teixeira over Jamal Hill. I was re-watching Jamal Hill versus Tiago Santos. And although Jamal Hill won that fight. Listen, Glover Teixeira didn't have an easy time with Tiago Santos either. Tiago Santos is not a good offensive grappler. He isn't. He's not a good offensive grappler. And uh, when he's on the ground, he seems lost. Like he was against Glover Teixeira whenever Teixeira ended up on top of him. Like, Teixeira was taking him down whilst rocked in that fight. And I watched Thiago, Mo uh, Thiago Santos in the Jamal Hill fight take him down six times. And Jamal Hill did a good job early on to stuff the takedowns. But there wasn't a lot of action early on in that fight. And I, I think Glover can play that game where he can sort of, like, wait out the first round. Take a bit of shots, give some shots back, give something for Jamal Hill to worry about on the feet. And then sort of start working his effective game as the fight goes on. Hill was doing a really good job throwing knees to the body in the in the clinch. Um, whenever Santos was going for takedowns. But I could see Santos was making mistakes with his takedowns. And I know that Jamal Hill stuffed 14 of the 20. But the 6 that Santos got. I noticed Hill giving up his back a little bit to try and get back up. I noticed him giving up bad positions on the ground. And sort of just bucking his way up very athletically. And I know, like, Glover, I thought he was going to be a bit done. But he looked so good against Yuri Prohaska, who is... The, he gets up in similar ways to Jamal Hill. Athletically, stubbornly, just escaping positions based on, like, stubbornness, pretty much. Rather than, you know, feet on hips, kicking off, coming up on a single leg. 
and stuff like that. He just sort of like bucks and gets himself to his knees and stands up really fast. I feel like Glover will take advantage of Hill if that happens. And we saw in like round three of Santos versus Hill, Santos chain wrestling him quite a bit and Hill starting to slow down. And Glover was keeping that pace until like halfway through round five with Yuri and Yuri was ripping up his body and Hill don't really go to the body like that. So I'm going to go with Glover Teixeira, finding his way into this fight in the second or third round and getting himself a rear naked choke. Maybe there'll be a moment where Hill rocks him in the first and Glover panic shoots a takedown and then they're against a cage for a little bit and he's holding on to Hill for a bit to recover himself. Maybe that'll happen early on. But I think as the fight goes on, Hill's going to be too worried about that takedown. And Hill's a fat fuck, dude. And that's coming from me as well. I just want to say that. I saw the video of him accepting the fight, which was in like the middle of December, a month ago. And he had such a huge belly on him. I, I just don't trust him to be drilling the right kind of grappling defense in training camp with a gut like that in training camp. I want him to be in shape year long like Yuri, training grappling defense with Henry Cejudo. And even that barely was enough for Yuri to somehow make it through the fight. There's a, so many other universities where Yuri loses that fight at some point on the ground. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I'm going to go with Glover. I'm going to go with Glover. Stayed in shape. Was supposed to fight in December. I reckon he'll get this one done. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching Toodle Pip. He trains with Pereira on a regular basis. I don't see he'll shocking him with any crazy stand-up that's going to catch him by surprise and KO him. You know what I mean? And he'll fight a lot like... Um, Pereira with the hooks, right? So, I'm siding with Glover Teixeira. See you later. Goodbye. Toodle Pip.